Welcome to this first theory seminar in the Miao seminar series for the autumn semester. It's a pleasure today to have with us Ian Mertz, who will be telling us about lifting with sunflowers. Please. All right. Uh, thanks so much, Jakob. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, to anyone on this side of the Atlantic, happy Labor Day. Uh, to everyone else, happy Monday, I suppose. And uh, I'm going to be talking today, as Jakob said, about uh, lifting uh, a new proof of the basic query to communication lifting theorem uh, using a new connection to sunflowers. Uh, and I want to quickly acknowledge my co-authors on the West Coast. We've got Raghu Mecca at UCLA, uh, Jia Peng Zhang at University of Southern California, and Shahar Lovett in UCSD. And up in Toronto, uh, I have my advisor, Tony Patassi, who might be here today. I'm not sure. Anyway, so let's get started. So uh, today we're going to be talking about two computation models, one of them extremely weak and one of them extremely strong. So depending on your background, you probably have a different image for what these might look like. Uh, the models we're going to be talking about today are decision trees and communication complexity. So probably everyone here knows them, but I'll just run through them real quick. Decision trees are some of the most basic objects for computing a function. Uh, if you have some input variables, z1 up through zn, the decision tree simply decides to look at a variable and branch based on what the result that it sees is. So uh, if the first input bit is 0, then it would travel to the left side of the, tr uh, of the root. And then it would decide to query z3. And so then it would see 1. And when it reaches a leaf, it will declare that it knows the answer, in this case, 1. So our decision tree complexity uh, is going to be measured the depth of, uh, of the decision tree. So the decision tree complexity of f is the minimum depth of uh, any decision tree computing f. And like I said, this is a weak model. Uh, it's not too hard to see that you can actually completely stump this thing. Uh, the most that the depth will ever be is n, because most will have to query all the input bits. And even for the OR function, you can get uh, something like depth n. So this is a model that really can't compute uh, very strong functions. And then our other fighter this evening is uh, communication complexity. So here, we no longer have one set of input variables, z1 up through zn but two sets. We've got uh, the x variables, x1 to xn, and y variables, y1 to ym. They could be balanced, they could be not. And we're going to imagine that they're in the hands of two very powerful players, Alice and Bob. And these players can compute anything that they want, uh, given what they know about the input. You know, They could uh, interpret it as a Turing machine and compute the halting problem. That's fine with us. But since the function's on two sets of variables, they do actually have to talk to each other in order to solve the function. And so we're going to decide on a protocol beforehand. And then when they get their inputs, they start exchanging some messages until one of them feels confident that they can declare the answer. And our measure uh, of complexity here is going to be the number of bits that they need to send in the worst case. Uh, over, uh, and of course, you know, communication complexity is the best protocol with respect to this measure. But since we're comparing it to decision trees, we're going to look at it as a, a tree itself where now instead of being labeled by individual variables, there's going to be these, uh, you can compute arbitrary functions at each of the internal nodes. And the only catch again is that these arbitrary functions can only be over one half of the input, either the x variables or the y variables. And then again, uh, our uh, complexity is going to be measured by the depth. So this is our strong model. Uh, just to sanity check ourselves, if you really wanted to, if you want to compute the OR function of all the X's and all the Y's, you really, this takes two, maybe even one round. Uh, just one of the two players computes their OR and sends it over. So, okay, this isn't much in terms of bragging rights, but here's a, a motivation that comes out of some of the early work on communication complexity. So imagine we've got a one party function, so F on Z1 up to Zn. And we're going to define a function called the search problem on f. And the search problem on f, there's uh, the x variables are going to stand in for an input to the function little f such that the output is 1. And the y variables are going to be an uh, input to f such that the output is 0. 
And clearly, since f outputs something different on these two sets of variables, there's got to be a difference somewhere. There's got to be some coordinate uh, where they differ. And their only goal is to find that coordinate. And what this beautiful uh, duality theorem of Kreshmer and Vigerson showed in the mid 90s is that if you have a formula for computing the function little f, you get a search problem, uh, sorry, a uh, communication protocol for the search uh, problem on f. And I don't just mean like you can uh, extract it, but rather you get, you can just take the formula and replace the internal gates with functions and keep all the variables uh, at the leaves exactly the same labels and vice versa. If you have a search function or if you have a communication protocol for the search function, you get a formula immediately with the same structure. So considering we only know something like uh, logarithmic lower bounds on the depth of uh, any function f for uh, formulas, this should indicate that communication can really do some pretty strong things. So that's just a flavor of uh, the strength of communication. Today though, what we're gonna be focusing on is lifting. And the intuition behind lifting is that we now have our two models, one of which is it's just easy to run circles around. You know, We can get pretty strong lower bounds basically for free. And then we have, oh, was that a chat? No, it was not. Okay, uh, and then we have another model which we would love to get stronger lower bounds for. Uh, and they look sort of similar. So maybe we can actually do something with this. Maybe there's some procedure where if we have a lower bound for some function little f for decision trees, we can juice from it a really nice lower bound from our much stronger model uh, communication complexity. Now this seems like it might be a bit of a, a moonshot but let's look at what lower bounds we actually have for communication. Uh, I should emphasize, uh, despite what I said back here about we only have logarithmic lower bounds for uh, formulas, uh, when you go to communication complexity and we go outside the search function, you know, we do have stronger lower bounds. It's just that they don't translate to formula lower bounds. So, okay. So one function that we do have a very strong lower bound on in communication is the disjointness function, or not disjointness. Uh, and in this problem, we're going to interpret Alice's input as a set and uh, Bob's input also as a set. So they're both going to be given a bit string uh, of n bits, and they're going to interpret it as the indicator vector or some set over the universe uh, one to n. And they want to output one if and only if there's some uh, element that is in both of their sets. In other words, if they're not disjoint. So there is a lot of work showing that this is hard for communication. It's hard for even stronger forms of communication. Uh, and what I want to draw attention to here is that while these problems may not look totally uh, related or function disjointness, if we switch to Boolean logic, uh, they actually form a nice little uh, suggestive form. So the OR function, of course, is just the OR of Z1 to Zn. And if we move to disjointness, now we've got an OR and instead of uh, z1 to zn, each zi is replaced by the and of xi and yi. This, this little and just tests whether or not the ith element is in uh, both sets. And so somehow what we can say is that obviously uh, the communication protocol can get n, besides the fact that n is a trivial upper bound, it could just you know, ask about each element in turn, uh, but somehow it can't do much better than that. The, even though it could theoretically express very complicated relationships over the variables z1 to zn, like their parity or something, uh, this little and function has obfuscated each of the inputs uh, slightly in a way that they can't do much better than just computing each bit that they care about in turn. And that's going to be the motivation behind uh, gadget lifting. So in gadget lifting, we take our single party function f on z1 to zn, and we're going to replace each variable with a gadget, g, on a fresh set of variables, uh, x1, y1, or x2, y2, up to xn, yn. And somehow we want to choose our gadget, g, such that Alice and Bob basically have to solve the gadget uh, on x y uh, yi just to know zi. And of course, by in turn, solving the gadget on xi and yi tells you nothing about zj for some other j. So, Hopefully, this puts them in a position where the best that they can do is try and 
uh, essentially just do the decision tree, right? Learn about the relevant coordinates and then proceed from there. So that's the dream. And in fact, oh, sorry, uh, let me rewind. So uh, what kinds of gadgets would have this nice suggestive structure? Um, well, parity probably immediately came to mind. It's a little bit interesting that we can do it with and in the case of disjointness, but the gadget we're gonna work with today uh, is even more obfuscated. It's the index gadget. In the index gadget, Alice is going to get log m bits, which she's going to interpret as a number one up to m. And Bob is going to get m bits, which he's going to interpret as an array of length m. And then the index gadget uh, is simply uh, outputting the value in Bob's array that's pointed to by y's element, uh, by uh, Alice's element. So here it would be zero, for example. And we kind of, this brings us to kind of the grandfather of all lifting theorems uh, by Roz and McKenzie in 1999, which uh, kind of saw a new life about five or six years ago uh, and kind of restarted this whole field of free communication uh, in this context. So what it says is that as long as you pick uh, M, the size of the gadget, slightly uh, large enough like poly N, then you can actually get exactly what you want. You get that the communication complexity of the lifted function is exactly the decision tree complexity of the unlifted function times some order log M factor. And the order log M factor is essentially just what it takes to solve the index gadget. So the upper bound is uh, easy. If we have a decision tree, then the communication protocol can uh, mimic it by every time they want to query a variable zi, they simply, uh, uh, Alice sends over xi and Bob sends back the value of the index gadget, which he now knows. So you can do it in dtf times log m plus one. Uh, and of course, the other way around is going to be where all the uh, hard work goes, and that's what we're going to cover today. Uh, so before moving into it, I just want to say that uh, there's a lot of really cool lifting theorems out there. The last 20 years has just been full of them. And uh, all of these various lifting theorems translate to some beautiful applications, like uh, getting very strong monotone formula or circuit lower bounds, uh, extended formulations, proof of complexity, automatability, um, of course, communication complexity itself, quantum even. Uh, I'm not going to be talking so much about those today. I stole these slides uh, from a talk that Tony gave, and I highly recommend you check it out. They're on her website. So there's a really deep field in lifting. And today, we're really just going to be scratching the surface. Uh, and the other thing I want to cover before we actually get into the proof is uh, what we're bringing to the table here. And we're basically going to be reproving the original, uh, the original query to communication lifting theorem that I stated but using a new technique. And this technique, of course, as the title suggests, uses sunflowers. And the benefits of this technique are that, first of all, it works for, uh, it works in a number of different contexts. It works for this tree-like one. It works for a DAG-like version. It works for what we call graduated lifting, which I'll cover in the second half of the talk. Uh, and it seems like it should be useful in a lot of other uh, areas. It has, it's, we've been working on BPP lifting and it's got some legs there, we'll see. Um, it also is very simple. There's a main technical lemma in a lot of these previous works or uh, some variation on uh, the same, uh, similar main technical lemma. And uh, in our case, we can just prove the strongest version of the technical lemma needed for most of these lifting theorems and it's two or three lines plus an application of sunflowers. So it's uh, very, very simple once you have uh, sunflower technology. Uh, as a side benefit, we actually get smaller gadgets as a result. So the gadget size is extremely important for getting the, for the applications to lifting, uh, such as getting really strong formula lower bounds or extended formulation lower bounds. And so what we, the dream would be to get M to be all the way to be a constant. In other words, we have a decision tree uh, for little f that is almost exactly a communication protocol uh, for capital F. And we make some incremental progress here by getting past uh, an n squared barrier that was inherent in most of these previous works and getting to n to the one plus epsilon. And while that's a minor improvement, it's also uh, removing a bottleneck of n squared. 
Right now, uh, the bottleneck in our approach is simply the strength of the current sunflower lemma. And so better sunflowers would immediately imply smaller gadgets, uh, which I'll come back to a little bit at the end of the talk. OK, so before jumping in, any questions? So I got a little bit curious about this barrier at n squared, but but is it fair to say, like, I mean, most of the lifting theorems before, I mean, they weren't at n squared. They were more like n to like 100 or, you know, 200 or something like that. So, right. It depends on which one you're talking about. I think, right, uh, DAG-like was 256 and such. Uh, if you really kind of took a close eye to them, a lot of them you could... Uh, you could get down to n squared if you were really uh, clever about choosing your variable parameters. I think a lot of people didn't bother to optimize, uh -huh. um, but if you watch talks, you can see that. But regardless, uh, yeah, some of them were way worse. Of course, some of them were much better, uh, even constant lifts, but not for um, you know the settings that we're talking about. So, mm -hmm. um, yes, anything else? All right, so let's get into our proof. So this is the statement we want to prove. Communication is dt times theta of log m, and we had the one direction. So we're going to assume that we've got a communication protocol pi, uh, which solves the lifted function and has depth d log m. And what we want is a decision tree for f of uh, depth uh, order d. And uh, for the people in the audience who are very familiar with these lifting theorems, you're going to have to bear with me for a moment. Um, so the first thing is that we want to view uh, communication protocols in yet one more way, a way that's going to be very useful to us. So if you think about how we would describe a function on z1 up to zn, uh, we usually do it with a truth table, right? Each row is indexed by an input, and then you just put the value of the function there. When you get to two-party functions, the natural generalization is to have like a matrix. So each of the rows is indexed by uh, some input to Alice, and each column is input, uh, indexed by some input to Bob, and then we just uh, put the value of the function at the corresponding location. So this just looks like uh, you know two-party uh, truth table. So it doesn't look that interesting, but it turns out that this is uh, a, has a pretty deep connection to how communication protocols actually operate. So here was our old view of communication protocols as trees. And we're going to keep the same tree-like structure, but we're going to replace each uh, internal function with what we call a rectangle. And the intuition is as follows. At the root, we start with every possibility for x and y uh, open. This, and so we have the entire truth table matrix that I just described. And then Alice is going to compute, say Alice speaks first, she's going to compute an arbitrary uh, function over her inputs, which essentially just means we're going to take every potential input and just sort it into two sets, zero and one, uh, based on what she answers. And this induces a partition of, the, uh, of this communication matrix. And depending on which way we go, we have some residual rectangle left uh, here. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but the zero rectangle above is what survives here because now Bob knows uh, her input isn't in the one side and vice versa on the other side. And they continue to cleave in this way. Now Bob would speak and split into two halves. And at the leaves, uh, it's not necessarily the case that Alice and Bob know exactly what uh, the other player's input is, but rather whatever inputs they may have left, it doesn't matter because they all give the same answer. And this is called a monochromatic rectangle, a rectangle where every entry is the same. Uh, just to kind of em emphasize the point on input x, y, uh, Alice is just going to say which side of her partition she's on, then Bob's going to say which side of his partition he's on, and then they're going to get down and declare the answer. So that's going to be our view of communication protocols for the rest of this talk. So the intuition for how uh, the starting intuition for these uh, lifting theorems is that we wanted, we picked the index gadget because we want to obfuscate each of the coordinates zi. And we want to know which, uh, which of these coordinates Alice and Bob are trying to learn about in some vague sense. So of course, if there's a particular zi that they actually need to know the value of, 
they can just figure it out in log M rounds. Again, Alice sends XI and Bob sends back the answer. And this log M is uh, the upper bound that we're shooting for. So if they send log uh, something like omega log M bits, in some vague sense, trying to learn about the coordinate ZI, uh, then we're satisfied. We're satisfied in the sense that if we query ZI, they've spent log M bits learning about it, and we've spent one um, bit. So we're on track to uh, shave the log M factor off the depth. And you've somehow um, made this ZI bit pay for this, right? Would, yes, exactly. Yeah, nifty we're, we're charging. Yours. Yeah. We, of course, uh, again, they can express extremely complicated relationships over the variables. So what it means that they've been trying to learn about ZI, I'm leaving intentionally vague for the moment. But somehow, if we can know that that's what they've done, then we can be uh, satisfied thinking that ZI is important enough for us to query. And on the flip side, uh, what we want to say is that if they haven't communicated a lot of information uh, about ZI, then they basically know nothing about ZI. Uh, and so we can consider it unimportant because if they could declare the answer now, then somehow it didn't depend on what the value of ZI was. So let's make it a little bit more formal. So let's say we're at a node in the communication protocol, we call it V, and this is associated with some rectangle RV in the way that I described a couple of slides ago. So we've got an X side XV and a Y side YV, which is some subset of the possible rows and columns. And I just said, we wanna know how much they know about a coordinate ZI. So how much do they know about ZI if I just look at this rectangle? And our answer is going to be that it depends on uh, the X side. So the, the immediate answer is it depends, well, if, uh, if there's only one value uh, for the index gadget on the ith coordinate for all these x's and all these y's, then of course they perfectly know it. But we're going to be ignoring the y side for the majority of this talk. It's going to come in at the end uh, simply because the y side is huge. And so we generally don't have to worry about it as much. So for today, we're going to say that what they know about the ith coordinate really depends on what the ith coordinate on the x side looks like. And in a formal sense, we're going to find the min entropy uh, of x. Uh, so really, this should be the min entropy of the uniform variable over the set x. But I'm going to use them interchangeably. The min entropy of the set x is going to be the minimum over all coordinates i and assignments alpha i to the ith coordinate of x of the entropy function uh, on that uh, of the probability that they're equal. And uh, just to kind of demystify this, if you have a coordinate that's totally known, so the ith coordinate is such that xi is always alpha i, every xi is alpha i, then you'd get a min entropy of zero because the probability would be one. And meanwhile, if all of our xi's are completely uniform, you know, we are at the very beginning of the protocol, then all of the probabilities are going to be one over m. And so we're going to get log m as the, uh, uh, as the min entropy. Uh, and min entropy obeys a lot of really nice properties. The first really useful one for us is going to be that if you're at some rectangle, like RV, and you cut it in half, you get two sides. You get uh, the R0 side and the R1 side, basically X0 and X1. And if we look at the bigger side, say X0, then the, uh, the min entropy can drop by at most one. This is not too hard to check. It's because you know uh, the size is divided in half, so you've add, it adds a minus one to the log. So this suggests where to start off, which is uh, we're going to start at the top of the of the communication protocol, and when we're at uh, some rectangle x v that's split in half by the current round of the uh, protocol, we're always just going to go to the larger side, and when this happens. We know that the min entropy goes down by at most one. And so it's going to take at, uh, at least like omega log m steps before the min entropy drops to like one minus omega of one of log m, drops to say 0 0.95 log m. And that's good. Uh, this omega log m is sort of what we're shooting for. And in particular, if the, block, if the min entropy drops by this amount, then uh, there's some coordinate which causes, uh, which causes the violation. There's some i in the minimum that does it. And we can now consider that to be one of our important coordinates and feel free to query it. This is how we can say that uh, 
we're, uh, you know, they're taking the time to be charged for it. Now, I'm going to leave aside the issue that multiple coordinates uh, could occur, because uh, that's going to come in a little bit later. But that's just the general flavor of how we're going to view uh, the communication protocol as having paid for the coordinate. Uh, and then for the unimportant coordinates, we have the following key lemma. And this is going to be where our sunflowers come in. So I'm going to come back to this at the very end. But we're going to repeatedly use the fact that if you have high min entropy on x, I say over line j, say j is some fixed set of coordinates. So over line j is all the free coordinates. Uh, if you have high min entropy on the free coordinates and the size of y remains uh, large enough, then the index gadget on those free coordinates has all possibilities free. Sorry, if this uh, overline J is confusing, just uh, think that we're looking over some specific uh, set of the coordinates. So this is what we want to say. Again, this is the idea that as long as they haven't, for every coordinate that they haven't paid for, all the options of the index gadget are available. And in fact, not just that zero and one are available for that coordinate, every joint assignment to all the free uh, variables is completely unknown. That's going to be our key lemma on the, uh, for the unimportant coordinates. And so what we're going to do is if we're at some rectangle RV and we now have a violation of, block, of uh, min entropy, uh, so we have some uh, coordinate i and some assignment alpha such that it's uh, fairly likely that x of i equals alpha, well, we can isolate that section of the x side. And this kind of splits y into two sections. The sections where uh, y would equal 0 on the index gadget if we picked an x from that block, and the sections where uh, the index gadget returns 1 if we picked an x from that block. So we want to know about the value of i. So what we're going to do is we're just going to toss out everything that doesn't uh, agree with that assignment. So we're going to throw out all the other uh, x's. And now, like I said, we're going to actually query the ith coordinate, and we're going to get some value. And we want to make sure that we stay consistent with that value. So if zi comes out to be 1, we're just going to toss out the 0 side. So we're going to make sure that we're in a rectangle where the index gadget actually agrees with what our decision tree knows so far, uh, and likewise for the zero side. So why do we have a zero side and a one side in the first place? You know, why can't one of these be empty? Well, this is one place where our uh, key lemma shows up, which is that we're going to assume up to this point that we have high min entropy and that y has remained large. And so as a result, we know that both of these possibilities are free. Now, it's not necessarily the case that both of them are large, and that's a point we're going to come back to later. But at the very least, this is going to be the flavor of our, uh, of our main invariant. So in addition, to the rect in addition to the communication protocol rectangles, R V, we're actually going to be maintaining our own rectangle, R, which is a subset. And it's going to maintain these nice properties, which is that first, the, in uh, the index gadget agrees with our decision tree so far. So if you pick any x and y and r, it gives the same uh, answers as our decision trees on all zi's queried thus far. I'm going to typically refer to this set as j, just for convenience. And the second property we want is that uh, the min entropy of x stays high on all the free coordinates. This would be the nice invariant that we want to maintain so we can apply our key lemma. Uh, and as again, as a side note, which I'll come back to at the end, we want the size of y to remain large. All right, if I could, uh, so I'm hiding a few things that I'm going to come back to, but if we could actually maintain this invariant, then uh, we're going to go all the way down until we get a leaf, at which point our decision tree knows the value of some vari uh, z variables and has others left uh, unfixed. And our rectangle, uh, the rectangle RL corresponding to the leaf L, is monochromatic. So we want to say that we're done, and we can return the same answer that the uh, communication protocol returns. So there would be an issue uh, if and only if there is some way of fixing the unfixed z coordinates, which actually gives the, the opposite answer. And this 
you can probably already see this coming, but this is going to be one more application of our main lemma. The fact is our rectangle still, uh, our rectangle R still maintains all of our nice properties. Min entropy is high and the size of Y is large. And in particular, this means that we can find an X and Y that gives the bad, uh, the supposed bad assignment. And that means that in that entry, the answer should be one. And that's a contradiction because we know that the larger rectangle is monochromatic. So that's how we handle the case of the leaves. All right, now to go and patch up uh, the lies that I've been telling. So first of all, I said, I talked about min entropy on one coordinate, but we have no idea what happens to the other coordinates. Uh, in fact, if you think about what I just did here, uh, I've removed a huge chunk of the X's available to us. So it's not unlikely that a different coordinate now has really, really small, uh, it causes the min entropy to become really, really small. So how are we going to handle that piece? Uh, and how, uh, and as a result, how are we going to disentangle when we're paying for coordinate i and when we're paying for coordinate j? And the answer to both of these questions is that we're going to generalize min entropy. So now we're going to have blockwise min entropy, and I'm reusing the same notation because I'm never coming back to single coordinates again. Uh, the blockwise min entropy is going to be the same statement, but now we're taking the minimum overall sets of coordinates, uh, uh, capital I and all joint assignments to all of the coordinates, alpha i. And I'm going to include this normalization factor of one over size of i so that it obeys all the, the same properties. This uh, quantity is between zero and log m. And uh, you know, the blockwise min entropy decreases by at most one when you cut a rectangle in half and go to the bigger side. So this is all the same nice properties that we want. Uh, and now what we can do is instead of picking a coordinate little i, we can pick a capital I, alpha i, and in particular, a maximal one. Maximal in the sense that we can't add any more coordinates to it and still be violating blockwise min entropy. And this allows us to say that when we actually go to this smaller x uh, rectangle, we know that the remaining coordinates, the unfixed coordinates, do have this blockwise min entropy restored. So that allows us to maintain the, uh, the invariant on the x side. Just to give a picture, again, of what this looks like, here was when we took a slice that agreed with this two likely assignment to little i. And now we're going to have a slice that corresponds to the two likely assignment to capital I. And for each potential uh, output of all of the coordinates, so now there's two to the size of i of them, we're going to have uh, a section of y's, which uh, are going to be the ones that actually output that joint assignment beta. So that takes care of the invariant on the x side. And now I have to finally get to the y side. Uh, what happens if one of these y, uh, y's is small? But then we can no longer approve. You're huh? sort of saying this, I guess. But, but what can happen Like if I set up, if the communication protocol somehow is set up in such a way that the entropy is very, very high. And then suddenly there's like a massive drop for large set I. Uh, then you're going to issue, you're actually going to query all of those Z coordinates. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll query every, Yes, we're going to query uh, every single one of them potentially. Um, the actual argument, which I'll get into in the second half of the talk, you can use a potential argument uh, to show that the number of rounds that you would need to spend in order to have this drop for a mate, uh, for a large enough set is like the size of that set times log m. So you can't get around it by doing that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, the, yes, that is important. So now the y side is something that we have to maintain. We want to make sure that our y side is always large. And in particular, we want to make sure that when we uh, do this step and we break it up into these blocks, whatever result we get for the index gadget, or whatever result we get from our decision tree, such that we have to go to this smaller brick, uh, we actually maintain largeness on the y side. And so what happens if uh, there's some beta for which this is small? So here's it pictorially. We've got uh, our bad assignment isolate. We've got our assignment for the x side isolated, but there's some bad assignment to the y's. So the first answer would be just throw out all of these x's, right? OK, this was a too likely assignment, but too likely still means if we tossed out this entire, all of these rows, the remaining piece of x would be 
almost the entire size of X. It would be like, you know, you'd get, you'd throw out not even half of it. And so this causes a small drop in block Weismann entropy, but it's worth it to avoid this bad situation. Um, so of course, in that situation, then you'd have to check the block Weismann entropy on everything remaining uh, to make sure you don't have a violation. And this can cascade for a while. So we're gonna lean into it and just do that. Uh, every time we have a blockwise min entropy violation, we're going to do the following procedure. Find an assignment that violates blockwise min entropy, fix it, and remove those X's from the rest. Then repeat the process and repeat until we get all the way to the end. So we have some set of two likely assignments. Of course, at some point we may run out of two likely assignments and then you can think of it as being like uh, the empty uh, assignment, which just covers the rest. And what we want to argue at this point is that one of these things is going to work for us. One of these uh, sets, xij equals alpha j, is going to uh, maintain largeness on all of the y blocks. And this is tricky because, again, our main lemma just says that uh, every possibility is available, not how many possibilities are available. So we're going to lean into that or we're gonna, we're gonna utilize that fact by just removing every Y that shows up in a bad, uh, one of these bad sets up here. So go to each of these uh, assignments. And if there is some small uh, Y block, then just remove all of those Ys from the entire rectangle. And of course, these Ys are small by assumption, which means uh, there's gonna be some union bound which shows that we barely toss out any of the Ys you know, way less than half of the Ys, for example. And now we're in a position where we can apply our main lemma because uh, this says that the index gadget has all possibilities free. And note that in any of the uh, rows where we tossed out a whole Y block, the index gadget does not have all possibilities free on any of those Xs. In particular, the bad assignment that we threw out has no, uh, has no Ys left that give that assignment. By extension, that means that there's some row X such that we didn't toss out any of the Y blocks. And in particular, that means that in that, uh, in that row, uh, all of these blocks are still large because if they were small, we would have thrown them out. So that's how we're, uh, this is kind of like a disperser versus extractor property, uh, I think is what they say in sunflower literature, the idea of you have the full range available to you versus you have stuff that's roughly uh, uniform. So I'm going to, before I move on to the proof of our, this main lemma that I've been using over and over and over again, uh, do we have any other questions? All right. And when I've, once I've proven this main, uh, this, this uh, lemma up here, then I'll kind of recap this entire procedure in a bit more detail uh, just to kind of make it stick. So this is going to be the lemma that we actually prove. The lemma that we prove is that if you have high blockwise min entropy uh, in the free coordinates, specifically blockwise min entropy like 0 0.95 log m minus uh, order one, this order one is from the, um, you know, the fact that we just cut a rectangle and dropped below the threshold. So if you have this uh, blockwise min entropy and the size of y is two to the mn minus n log m, um, two to the mn would be if we had all of the y's available to us. So this is gonna be the amount that we're losing. Then not only do you have the full range available to you, but there's a specific row x star in x such that the index gadget on the free coordinates has full range on just that row. In other words, for every assignment to the free coordinates, you can find a y such that uh, x star y gives that output. And so going back to this, of course, if we pick one row, then by the argument that I said before, we know that whatever x uh, assignment it agrees with of the assignments that we found, uh, that's going to be the good row to go into. All right. And now we can finally get to sunflowers. So sunflowers are an object in combinatorics. Uh, it's a set system. 
And the idea is that it's a set system where they all share a common intersection. So there's some set which we call the core C, such that uh, it's in every one of the sets in our sunflower. But there is no element uh, outside of the core that's in more than one set. In other words, the common intersection of any two uh, sets in the set system is the core. Uh, we call those sets outside of the core the petals of the sunflower as a kind of suggestive uh, pictorial thing. So the famous sunflower lemma of Erdős and Rado in the 60s, maybe 1960 exactly, is that if you have uh, a set system where all your sets have size at most d for some d, and your set system itself has size at least d factorial times k to the d from k, then there's some sunflower that lies inside of it, and it has at least k petals. So this is what the lemma says. And the proof of it is so simple uh, and useful to us that we're just going to go through it. So the proof is that you ask the question of how many, uh, what's the maximum number of disjoint sets you can find in your set system f? And if the answer is that there are at least k, then we could just take the sunflower to be that collection. I didn't say the core has to have uh, anything in it. So we could just take the empty core and uh, that would give us a sunflower too. Meanwhile, if you have at most k, then uh, just by averaging, there's some element of the universe which is in at least a one over dk fraction of the sets. Uh, you know, At most k sets per, and uh, d is the number of elements in each set. So if you actually take uh, our size lower bound and divide by dk, you get d minus 1 factorial times k to the d minus 1. And this kind of tells us exactly what to do. We're going to add i to our core. And then we're going to recurse on the part of the sets in f that contained i. So now all of those sets have size d minus 1 once I've removed i. Uh, and the number of sets is uh, this statement. So just by recursion, eventually we're going to reach uh, the bottom and find a sunflower. So that's the whole argument. And still, this argument is, ha, has been the best that we've gotten for a very long time. A couple of years ago, there was a really amazing result uh, by Always et al. that showed that you can actually get it down to k log kd to the d uh, is the lower bound that you need on, uh, on f. And the holy grail would be to remove the dependence from d in the base altogether to get like just a function that depends on k or maybe even a constant times k. Uh, we know we can't go too, uh, too much less than this, but this is what we've been seeking out. So I'm going to say one word about the always at all proof because it's going to transition us into what we care about. Instead of starting from the number of disjoint sets and then in one case using averaging to say that some element is in a lot of sets, they're just going to start the other way around and ask, is there some set of elements that appears a disproportionate number of times, at least RT times, where R is some uh, very carefully chosen function? And again, we split into a win-win, where if the answer is no, then they can find a collection of disjoint sets S. And if yes, then you can recurse on T. And so uh, the goal is to make R as small as possible, and it depends basically on when you can prove this no case. So sort of similar to where we were at, they moved from going from single coordinates to uh, sets of coordinates. And even more suggestively, some set, does some set t appear at least r to the t times is basically the same as us asking, does some assignment to uh, the ith coordinate the, or the, you know, the coordinates in i to x appear at least some number of times. In fact, you can rephrase their, uh, this uh, condition as, does f have blockwise min entropy at most log r? And in the yes case, there's some t witnessing it, which you would recurse on. So that's kind of where the connection between sunflowers and lifting uh, seems to appear. And in particular, they have a core, le uh, a key lemma in order to prove the no case here. And this key lemma says that if f has blockwise min entropy, at least this is the function that they've chosen, log k 
where k is an absolute constant, log n over epsilon, where n is the size of the universe. Uh, then the probability, if you select a uniformly random set y over the universe, the probability that there is no set in our set system f, which is totally contained in y, this probability is at most epsilon. So again, in the second half of the talk, where I go into the technical details, uh, we'll see a little bit about why this is connected to sunflowers. But for now, we're just going to use this lemma directly out of the box. And it turns out that this is enough to prove our uh, full range lemma in just a few easy steps. So I'm just going to go through it right now, and then I'll take last questions. So we're going to assume for contradiction that there's no good x star that has full range, which means that for all x's, we can find some bad assignment beta x, which is not in the output of the index gadget uh, on little x and all of y. Um, I'm not going to go over this part, but it's pretty easy to see that your worst case for these beta x's uh, is when you have all ones. Worst case means, um, well, I'll come back to that actually in just a second. So for now, just assume that the beta x's are the all ones assignment. Um, so the universe, we're, we need to cast this in the language of sunflowers or set systems. So our universe is going to be mn. In fact, it's going to be like m times n. And in this world, we can view each x as being a subset of the universe of size n. This is just uh, the places in the universe that x points to. Uh, again, viewing it as like little m times little n. And by assumption from the full range lemma, the blockwise min entropy of our set capital X is at least 0 0.95 log m minus order one. And we're going to set m such that this thing is at least what we need for the sunflower, uh, for the lemma that I just stated, where our epsilon is two to the minus n log m. And I want to make a, put an emphasis here, that this is the only place that the gadget pop, uh, size pops up in the entire proof. So if I stripped out the extraneous factors on the right-hand side here and the order one here, and what we get is that 0 0.95 log m has got to be at least this, which translates to m to the 0 0.95 is greater than n log m. You can probably see where the one and m to the one, sorry, m equals n to the one plus epsilon is coming in. This is uh, pretty close to that. So all right, we're going to fix an m that satisfies this property. And now we have everything that we need to apply our lemma from the previous slide. In particular, if we take a random subset of the universe mn, then the probability that there is no x in our set uh, in our set capital X such that uh, x is fully contained in y, that probability is at most our epsilon, 2 to the minus n log m. And now to recast this back out of the language of sets, this says that if you sample a random bit string y of length mn, the probability that y of x is not equal to the all ones vector uh, for all x is at most this epsilon. So to see this, we viewed x as a set where it was just over mn, which was everything it pointed to. Now we're looking at y, the bit string, as being an indicator vector. So in other words, y would contain the set x if and only if uh, the outputs on uh, x are exactly uh, 1 to the x, uh, the uh, outputs of the index gadget. So just to move this up here, that's the same line as before. Uh, now we're going to move from this probability view to just a set, a counting view and say that the set of all y's such that uh, this condition is true is at most the total possible number of y's, you know, times this probability. So 2 to the mn minus n log m. Uh, and here was where I, uh, sorry, I skimmed over it before, but this, this quantity here is maximized when beta is one to the, uh, is the all ones assignment. Uh, this is irrespective of all the sunflower stuff. You can just show that whatever beta you choose here, this set uh, is strictly, uh, is at most uh, the size when this is the all ones assignment. Anyway, um, I can go over that later. But anyway, so this, this wraps it up because now this is the set of all y's that are bad. And we know that this is strictly smaller than y by assumption, because we assumed that y was larger than this, which means that there's some y 
in capital Y such that there exists an X such that Y of X equals beta X. And that's a contradiction because we assumed that uh, beta X was not at all in the image of the index gadget for X. So that's basically it. Um, all right, before I take uh, the question, I'll just recap our entire, uh, our construction. So uh, we have some, so there's some rectangle RV corresponding to the current node V, start, where V is starting at the root. And we're gonna be maintaining a rectangle R, which is X times Y, which is a subset of it. And it's going to be the case that the index gadget uh, of X and Y is fixed on some coordinates J. That's going to be our recursive structure. Uh, J starts out empty, V starts out the root, R starts off uh, as RV, et cetera. So now at the current step, we're gonna split it in half. Uh, we're gonna split RV in half, or rather the protocol splits RV in half. And we're gonna go to whichever side um, has a larger intersection with our rectangle R. This causes the blockwise min entropy to drop by at most one. And so then we're going to do this partitioning procedure where we uh, look for assignments that have to, that violate blockwise min entropy, kind of partition off all those X's and then repeat. And we're gonna do this uh, as many times as we need to. And then we're going to uh, go into each of those. And if there is a set, I call it YJ beta. This is the set of all Y's that kind of output beta uh, where the index gadget outputs beta uh, if your input comes from xj. So we're going to look at each of those and ask the question, is it too small? And if it is, then we're going to remove uh, every y that's in it. At the end of that, we're going to have at least half of y left over. And so we're going to apply the full range lemma and find some uh, row x star, which is good. And it's going to be contained in some xj. So then we know that we can query all the coordinates uh, in ij and safely set our rectangle to be whichever uh, whichever brick comes out of it. So xj and then yj beta, where beta is the result. We add our set ij to the set of fixed coordinates and uh, we buy all of the properties that I stated, we maintain our invariant. And we just continue this way until we reach the leaves. Again, there's a potential argument which shows that you uh, every time we fix a coordinate, there really was something like uh, order lo omega log m rounds spent on it in the in the blockwise min entropy, and so when we reach the leaf, then we uh, use the full range lemma one more time to say that no bad assignment can occur. Uh, all right, any any questions? All right, uh, I'm basically out of time. So I just want to say that a previous work from a few years ago showed that you can actually uh, get better sunflowers from uh, better lifting theorems. And what, as I alluded to at the beginning and as probably became clear, we show that better sunflowers uh, gives you better lifting. So the other direction. To make this a little bit more explicit and to live up to my promised gadget size, uh, instead of 0 0.95 log m, I could have used one minus delta log m. Know, for any delta that I choose, uh, some small constant, 0 0.000001 or whatever. And then the uh, equivalent condition to apply the sunflower lemma is that m to the 1 minus delta is at least n log m. And so, of course, I can just pick my delta to be small enough such that you can pick m to be like n to the 1 plus epsilon for any chosen epsilon. Uh, but in particular, the only bottleneck here is what the parameters of that particular sunflower uh, that lemma from the sunflower paper that I used was. And we don't really have an upper bound on it or uh, a lower bound on it. So if you can improve that lemma, immediately I can just push the gadget size uh, further down and get a better lifting theorem out of it. So these two works together suggest that there's a really, there is something really inherent about lifting and sunflowers. They're very, they're very closely related to each other in some deeper sense. And I think that this is uh, worth exploring. And in particular, of course, uh, for open problems, if you want to get the gadget size down, the previous slide sort of indicates that you're, you're you have to be thinking about sunflowers. 
And uh, the gadget size is such an important quantity to us that that's really the big open problem. Uh, and sunflowers are so important to the combinatorics community that it's a, kind of a cool problem to chase regardless. Uh, and the other thing that I've been thinking about a little bit, which I would be really interested to talk to anyone about, is whether or not this sunflower um, technique can come across, uh, can go to a different gadget, something like inner product. Uh, it seems like we've really picked things uh, in a specialized way for the index gadget, uh, and that these counting techniques aren't really going to carry over very well. But um, there's still a little bit of hope, and I'm. Uh, it would it would be very interesting to get this to work for inner product, especially because our proof works for things like dag like lifting, where we don't know it for the inner product gadget. And I'm going to say that that's it. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. So I guess we're opening up for for um, questions now. So 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 let me just start. This is a naive question, but um, so if you have a two-way connection between sunflower lemmas and the gadget lifting size doesn't that i mean wouldn't that, like you know i start worrying that constant gadget size would give two good sunflower lemmas or no there are no such barriers that you would need to do something else somehow or no so i've been trying to figure this out so right we do have a lower bound on the sunflower lemma the, the sunflower, uh, you know, the potential for like the sunflower conjecture. Uh, what we're doing here is uh, something called robust sunflowers. So this is like a probabilistic construction. And there is a connection between sunflowers and robust sunflowers, but it turns out that, um, let me go back to the lemma. So here, uh, what I'm hiding is that uh, this subset doesn't actually have to be uniform. You could pick a P biased subset and the size that is required depends on P. And it just so happens that the connection between robust sunflowers and actual sunflowers involves a P, in su uh, involves a P placed in such a way that you'll never actually, um, you can never get too good of a sunflower lemma if you pick P to be one half. The connection goes by picking P to be like uh, some function of, uh, of the set size K. And uh, you can never get smaller than like K minus the K minus one in the base, which would be the lower bound. That's as far as I can tell. This is a long way of saying uh, it seems to be just abstracted out enough that I don't know uh, of an existing lower bound uh, or yeah, anything to suggest that this would be too hard. Uh, I still think it'll be hard, uh, extremely hard actually, but there's, uh, I was trying to think of a counter example uh, like a probabilistic construction that uh, gave some lower bound and I couldn't come up with anything. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? I think we have nothing in the chat, but maybe see if there's anything from the audience. Otherwise, we um, take something like a uh, whatever time we need to grab a cup of coffee. This is usually between five and 10 minutes. Maybe we should just say a 10 minute break. We'll reconvene at uh, like 15 minutes past the hour. Sure. So we are back after the break and now starting the second technical part of the seminar and it's over to you again, Ian. Uh, all right. So um, yeah, I guess this is the part of the seminar where I kind of pull up the hood and go into stuff. Um, there's not a lot under the hood that you haven't already seen, but I'll, I'll try and cover some of the parts that I sort of skimmed over and let me know if there are any specific aspects of the proof that uh, you think are uh, important to know about. I'll try and give uh, a couple minutes, especially on the deficiency argument that actually shows that you have at most uh, D steps in it. So uh, a definition that I alluded to uh, a lot when I was talking was what we call row structure, a row structured rectangle. So here row is in zero, one star, the N, uh, and we'll just, for convenience, say that uh, J is the fixed coordinates of row. 
So if you have a rectangle R, then R is row structured if the following three conditions hold. The first is that the index gadget uh, in the coordinates J uh, is equal to uh, you know, row on those coordinates. And uh, here we're going to say x. If you restrict to j, you actually only have one assignment. So x's, all the x's uh, have the same um, the same pointers within the coordinates, uh, the fixed coordinates. Two is that. Uh, the blockwise min entropy of x on the free coordinates, uh, this thing is at least, um, actually, I'm going to use 1 minus delta here because it'll be interesting. Uh, 0 or 1 minus delta log m. And I'm going to put a little asterisk here, minus order 1. Uh, ignore that for the moment. And 3, again, the size of y is at least 2 to the mn minus d log m. Maybe I need two, two D log M. D is the decision tree uh, upper bound that we're shooting for. So this thing's of course at, always at most at. So this is gonna be row structured. Um, it's gonna be row structured uh, without this part here. If there's a minus o, uh, o of one in the blockwise min entropy, then we'll call it row almost structured. And what is, wait, so what's D here? Like D is the number of? D is the decision tree upper bound that we're shooting for. So okay. pi has, uh, the depth of pi uh, is D log M. And we want uh, the depth of our decision tree, this should be depth, not size, but sorry, uh, to be order D. Okay. So you can just think of this as N if you want. Oh, am I lagging? Oh, there we go. Strange. OK, you fine with that? So intuitively, this is saying that we're only going to, for every coordinate that we query, we're only going to lose like a log m fraction of y. Should be, uh, maybe it'll become clear why this is our, um, why this is our cutoff in just a second. So. Uh, we've got, we, what we want to do, our main subroutine is, uh, as I talked about, is that we want, uh, we often have a row almost structured rectangle. It's row almost structured because we just cut um, our rectangle in half. And we want to restore it to become a row structured rectangle. Actually, I guess it's row prime structured rectangle for some new row prime. So we call this density restoration. It also goes by the name of the rectangle partition uh, in a lot of the previous papers. Um, I think this first appeared in the BPP lifting paper. So this is GPW uh, 2017. And I should say that a lot of, uh, pretty much everything that you see in this talk, other than the sunflower stuff, uh, is building upon uh, a whole line of previous work, making the, the proof of these query to communication lifting theorems um, more elegant. And you know we're just kind of contributing our part to that by replacing the main lemma. So, this density restoration uh, is going to go as follows. So we're going to initialize uh, j to be 1, um, r greater than or equal to j, aka r greater than or equal to 1, uh, to be r, our current rectangle. And uh, our set f is going to be the empty set. And so first, we have the x part, uh, which says that while um, size of r size of r greater than or equal to j is greater than zero, uh, I'm going to come back to this part in a moment. Uh, I'm actually lying a little bit here, but while r greater than or equal to j is uh, non-empty, uh, find a simply empty. Uh, assignment i j alpha j such that probability of x sampled from x greater than or equal to j um, 
x i j equals alpha j is again too likely. This is strictly greater than two to the, oops, greater than two to the minus zero point nine five. Uh, I'll move this over. Zero point nine five uh, size of i j log m. So this would create a violation of blockwise min entropy. This i j here, by the way, is uh, what we got rid of with the normalization factor in the definition of blockwise min entropy. So this is a two. This is a two likely assignment, and so we're going to fix that assignment and then define x j not x greater than or equal to j. Sorry, uh, I just realized these should all be x's. Okay, there we go. Um, xj is just going to be the part that actually agrees with this. It's the set of all x in x greater than or equal to j, uh, such that uh, xij equals alpha j. So now uh, we're going to update everything. We're going to set x, we're going to set. Uh, we're going to add one to j, so we're incrementing j. And then we're going to define our new x greater than or equal to j uh, as x. Uh, sorry, that's the fax machine. Um, x greater than or equal to j minus one minus x j minus one. This is the thing we just defined above. Uh, and we're going to add uh, f gets f plus the new assignment. So it's ij alpha j. So we're going to do that until we run out. Like, notice that if we get an empty assignment here, um, if we get an empty assignment in this first step, then everything that's remaining in x greater than or equal to j is going to agree with it. And so we're going to uh, remove everything in this last step. Uh, and now that's the x part. The y part is for all j and beta in 0, 1 to the ij. We're going to define y j beta as uh, the set of all y in y, such that uh, y ij alpha j equals beta. So this is our rectangle procedure. Let me see if I've got some space to draw it just real quick. So this is sort of what we had before. We're going to, this is going to be x1, x great. Uh, notice that we have like x greater than or equal to 1. Then this next part is x2. This is x greater than or equal to 2. Uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and then in the y part, that's the x part. And then in the y part, we just divide up into these little bricks such that the index gadget is fixed in each of them. So that's what our density restoration uh, looks like. Uh, and I actually, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. So the goal was to show that if we started with row almost structured, now these bricks are row structured. And so the first step is that it's very clear that the index gadget on j cup i j, uh, x j, y j beta is equal to rho. Um, and then you fix um, i j equals beta. So you take your existing rho, and then you're going to fix some pre coordinates, namely i j. Uh, to be exactly beta. So this holds by construction, right? Uh, every x in xj has some fixed assignment alpha. Uh, and then yj beta is defined as everything that gives you um, beta in the coordinates ij if the assignment in ij is alpha. So this suggests that this is going to be our row prime for which we're structured. Um, the next part is that if x uh, j in the oh. 
that this is at least zero point, nope, uh, one minus delta log m. So we've actually restored the density. Uh, and this is again by construction, possibly empty, I didn't say it here, but maximal assignment. Uh, you can basically use a kind of chain rule for uh, chain rule for, actually, I want to keep that. So I'm going to use this space over here. Um, so like if you had some, uh, some other bad assignment, uh, I star that violated blockwise min entropy in XJ, then you'd get like uh, probability X I star uh, equals alpha star uh, is strictly greater than, because it's a bad assignment, you get two to the minus zero point, yeah, one minus delta uh, size of I star log M times uh, probability that uh, X I J equals alpha because this is the probability of all X in X J X from X J and here would be the probability of all X from X greater than or equal to J. Uh, oh, no, sorry. It's going to be X greater than or equal to J. There we go. So the probability that uh, you take an X from X greater than or equal to J and it equals, uh, and you have this thing uh, is at least this probability. And this is also uh, two to the minus one minus one minus delta size of I J log M. And so if you multiply these two probabilities together, it turns out that you could have added the set I star to, oh, I forgot this part, I J equals alpha. Uh, sorry, this is all pretty unimportant. This is just showing that like, if there is, if you pick a maximal assignment and you uh, claim that there is some still some bad set, which has, uh, which you violate blockwise min entropy for, on, you can use the chain rule to show that that could have been added to your initial uh, maximal assignment and you'd still get an entropy violation. Uh, it's a pretty unenlightening calculation. So anyway, the point is that these two steps are uh, pretty, pretty easy. I still have something to come back to up there. Uh, so I'll try and remember that. But uh, the last thing is we wanna show that, uh, we can't show that every yj beta is big, but we wanna show that at least in some row, uh, j, every yj beta is big. And again, our preconditions are gonna be that the blockwise min entropy of x is at least, well, minus delta log m minus order one, because we started with row almost structured. And the size of y is at least two mn minus n log m plus one. Again, this we can just assume because uh, n is greater than or equal to d. Uh, in fact, we can assume without loss of generality that uh, D is like little o of n, since otherwise we're basically done. We could just uh, have a decision tree of uh, height order n and uh, solve any function. So we know that we have this uh, because we're row almost structured. And then we want to say that there's a good row. So this is going to be what good means for us. The size of y j beta is at least the original size of y uh, divided by two size of i j log m. And just to note, if we actually had uniform over all the betas, then this would be two size of i j. Uh, we're not going to shoot for totally uniform. We're going to pay a log m in the exponent. And that's going to be fine for us. So sort of like before, if we're assuming that this is not true, then that means that for all j, there exists a beta uh, such that size of y j beta, uh, let's call this beta j size of y, j, beta, j. This thing is strictly less than y over two to the size of i, j, log m. And the proof is going to be by a contradiction of showing that we can split y into two parts, both of which are too small. You know, both of which are way less than half of the total size of y. So we're gonna call them y equals and y not equals. Y equals is the set of all Y's that are in some Y, uh, some bad Y, J, beta, J. So 
you could think of this as just saying y in y j comma beta j. And then the second part is going to be the y's that fall in no bad y j to uh, beta j. So if I can show that both of these things are strictly less than the size of y over two, uh, then I'm done. So the y not equals part, um, I'm just gonna do that first. This is obviously the part where we make our improvement by introducing the full range lemma with our proof. But I actually went through all of the details of the full range lemma that are required, except for maybe that DNF counting. So I'm just going to assume that we've got it. And then here, of course, I um, can say assume otherwise, and then apply full range lemma. <laughs> and we get that there exists a, you know, a good X star with full range. And so by extension, there exists an XJ, which actually contains X star. So this, uh, now we claim, of course, that uh, beta j is actually available uh, in the image because uh, x star has full range. So in particular, there's an x, uh, whatever xj it's in, it's the case that the index gadget on um, xj y not equals, uh, well, contained in this thing is beta j. So that's, uh, that's just going to be that part. That's uh, easy once you have the full range lemma. This part uh, here, I said as a union member before, I actually think that this is a very interesting uh, part of, the, uh, of this proof. And this is uh, this previously, um, in previous proofs, there was a union bound uh, that was required. And the union bound in particular required you to have uh, a certain gadget size. It required you to fix M to be large enough for the uh, for this um, union bound to work. But we've sort of found a way around that and removed the dependence on the gadget size from this union bound. And that is one of the things that really helps us to uh, uh, to get uh, remove the bottleneck to future constructions. So let me just show that real quick. So we're going to split. Um, we're going to split all of our assignments into pieces of uh, corresponding size. So it's going to be j such that the size of i sub j is exactly equal to k. So this is just all the indices such that uh, the set has exactly size k. And what I want to uh, claim is that the size of fk, this thing is at most, uh, let's say, 2 to the uh, one minus delta of k log m uh, plus two, let's say. And the reason that this is, is that otherwise the size of x is at least, uh, oops, sorry, the size of fk times two to the minus 0 0.95 k log m times uh, the size of x. So this is because every assignment in fk corresponds to a two likely assignment in x. So uh, each two likely assignment takes up some uh, two to the minus 0 0.95 k log m fraction of x. And of course, I just, oh, sorry about that, one minus delta. Uh, and of course, I picked this size so that I would swamp that. And so you get that this thing is greater than like two times the size of x, which is a contradiction. So here, we're really crucially using the blockwise min entropy of x again. And the fact that even though we have these violations and it dropped below, uh, so uh, we're using the fact, right, that it, uh, we have these violations and these are all two likely assignments. So now we do have our upper bound on the size of fk. And that means that the size of y equals, uh, this thing is at most the size of fk times uh, size of y over two to the 
k log m. This is because every bad, uh, we define beta j in such a way that all of the uh, all of the yj betas have size at most y over two to the size of ij log m. Uh, we're looking at the kth part, so we can just replace that with k. Oh, sorry, this is uh, less than or equal to the sum over all k of this. So each of each element in fk corresponds to some set ij, and uh, the corresponding yj beta has at most this size. And since this thing is, uh, you know, up here, one minus delta times k log m, you can see that this is like sum over all k uh, y over two to the delta log uh, k log m, and this is less than y over two. So that's our union bound on the, on that side. All right, the last thing I wanna show, I kind of sort of took up all of my space, so I'm gonna kill all this. Uh, the last thing I wanna show uh, is why we get this uh, upper bound of D. And the argument is a deficiency argument. So it's gonna be a potential function argument. And um, we're gonna define the deficiency of a set X to just be kind of the flip of um, blockwise min entropy. In other words, you're gonna take the size log of the size of the universe and subtract off the blockwise min entropy. And since the blockwise min entropy is at most log the size of the universe, this thing is now in the range zero to log the size of the universe, where now zero means uh, very random, or actually uniform, really. And log size of x means uh, fixed. Uh, and the only reason for doing this is just to get it in a, in a way where it looks like a potential function, because the important part here is that d infinity of any set x has to be at least zero. And what we're going to show, uh, and this is our progress tracker, is that when you fix, uh, when we go into any xj and we have fixed those coordinates, the deficiency is going to increase by a, a little bit, in fact, this should be one, uh, but it's going to decrease by a factor of delta times size of ij log m. So quickly, what are the implications of this? Well, remember, we, uh, in the protocol, we're, we keep cutting the rectangles in half. And every time we cut a rectangle in half, the blockwise min entropy decreases by at most one, meaning that the deficiency increases by at most one. So in that case, that means that just from cutting the rectangles throughout the protocol, we get that the blockwise min entropy of uh, x at some step can be at most like d log m, just from proceeding down the, uh, the partition. Now, applying this lemma at every step, we get an increase of at most one, uh, one more at every step. So again, this is like, another d log m factor. But then every time we fix a coordinate, we're losing like delta log m from the deficiency, which means if we, in the end, we fix some set of coordinates j, this is minus delta j log m. And in order for this thing to be at least zero, it follows that size of j has to be strictly greater, or sorry, uh, at least, uh, two over delta times d. So that's what this, that's what this uh, key fact is saying. That's how we get our argument that we've never queried too many coordinates. So just to say a word about how this is proven. So where does the plus one come from? Um, so here's where I go back to something that I said earlier that I was going to have to correct later. When we do the rectangle partition, we're actually not going to partition all of x. We're going to cut it off at the halfway point, and we're only going to run the rectangle partition until it, uh, until it passes the halfway point. And the goal here is basically the same as uh, in our main thing, you know, cut a rectangle in half and go to the bigger side. It has uh, 
your min entropy drops by at most one. As long as we only rectangle partition the top half, then uh, all of our x greater than or equal to j's uh, has size at least size of x over two. And so uh, each of them only has deficiency like uh, deficiency of x plus an extra one. And that's going to be an important part of the proof. Uh, you have to adjust all of these proofs, all the proofs below it subtly to account for the fact that you're only rectangle partitioning half of it. So sorry, just to emphasize here, I'm going to get rid of this asterisk and say now this is size of x over 2. But this is a minor point. Um, this is fairly unimportant. We're, we lose half of x all the time, so th that's fine. So that's where this plus 1 comes from. Uh, the minus delta ij log m is, you can think of it in the following way. In, in x, we've accrued some amount of, uh, we, we've lost some randomness over time, which means we've gained some deficiency. We've accrued deficiency over time, one step at a time by splitting the rectangle in half. But now we're fixing some coordinate, um, some set of coordinates ij. And those coordinates had a lot of deficiency in them because it was a too likely assignment. In particular, since the blockwise min entropy was at most one minus delta ij log m, uh, sorry, yeah, yeah, the, the, yeah, the one minus delta log m, the amount of deficiency that we're losing by removing those coordinates from contention is at least delta ij log m. So I can do the calculation. It, it's not super, uh, yeah, not super informative, but let's just quickly say it. So d infinity of x, j, i, j. This thing is uh, equal to uh, n minus size of j uh, log m minus uh, log the size of x, j, size of i, j. Yes. Yes, that's correct. All right, so this is basically by definition. Then this thing is at most n minus, minus size of j log m minus, wait a second, do I actually have this correct? Let me just double check my notes real quick. Yes. So this is minus log size of x greater than or equal to j minus 2 to the minus 2 to the minus 0 0.9, 2 to the minus 1 minus delta times uh, ij log m. So why does this step happen? This is just because the size of xj is at least the size of x uh, greater than or equal to j times uh, this factor. And this is because, again, uh, xj fixes an assignment that's at least this likely, which means it took up at least that much of a fraction of x greater than or equal to j. Sorry, this should be log of this whole thing. Oh, no, ra rather it should be log this minus the log of this thing. So this should be minus 1 minus delta ij log m. Good. Uh, or rather plus, sorry. There we go. So it should be uh, minus minus. So that's just uh, that just follows from the previous line and some bound on uh, how much how large of a fraction xj is within x greater than or equal to j. So now I'm going to do a minus log size of x plus uh, log size of x. This delivers unto me. Oh, did I miss a factor? I did. Uh, sorry about that. I wasn't originally planning on going through this calculation, but I actually think it's important enough to, to do. Minus size of ij times log m. So this is the these are the set of all the number of uh, unfixed coordinates in xj outside of ij. We started with n coordinates. We fixed j. And then we fix ij in here. 
So there's a minus ij here as well. And now this thing is greater than or equal to uh, n minus size of j log, um, log m. That's just this factor. I'm just regrouping terms here. Minus log of size of x, this thing. And then we've got a minus ij log m and a plus one minus delta j log m. So that's minus delta size of ij log m. Uh, and then we've got a plus log x and a minus log x over j. So that's plus log of size of x over size of x greater than or equal to j. So just to see what we've done here, we've removed this ij term out here because we want to talk about the number of coordinates fixed in x, not xj. So this whole term here, oops, this whole term here is just uh, the deficiency of x. So we've sort of grouped things such that we get the deficiency of x. Now, this minus ij log m, that's just the amount of deficiency that you're removing by removing those coordinates uh, in contention. And the amount of deficiency that you're gaining back is, this, is at most this 1 minus delta uh, ij log m, because there was a lot of uh, Uh, because which comes from the deficiency when you fixed uh, uh, from that fixed assignment. And then this log x over log greater than or equal to j factor over here is again just like the amount of deficiency that you're inherently gaining by going to a set that's smaller than x. You're going to x greater than or equal to j. Again, this thing is at most one because we never let x greater than or equal to j be less than half of the size of x. And so uh, then this delta ij log m is exactly what falls out. That's the deficiency that we're losing uh, because of the uh, amount of deficiency that was uh, that is being removed when we marginalize off ij. So that's the potential argument. Uh, it's probably if, if you care about this, it's, it is really just extremely straightforward. But uh, it is important to see that that's where our uh, our charging is coming from. If we looked at this the other way around, instead of as deficiency as blockwise min entropy, it's more just the simple fact that when we fix some set of coordinates, we're losing any blockwise min entropy that they held, or, or um, we're losing any losses that it held. And in this case, there was a big loss because it was a too likely assignment. All right, uh, I took a little bit longer on this whole part uh, than I wanted to, but I think that that's fine because I think it's good to nail down all of these details. Um, there's nothing really else interesting. The simulation procedure is exactly as I described. Cut it in half, go to the bigger half, um, apply the rectangle partition, apply this uh, y part, and then uh, uh, query the corresponding variables in the decision tree and branch accordingly. Uh, so before I before I go on, are there any parts of this that should be clearer? I, I'm kind just of going to, through. Just to recap again, you're going to, I mean, when I did, uh, when I split x into, mm -hmm. then you're going to like repeatedly, I mean, then now you're going to collect the, the, the set of indices that that we're potentially going to query. And you're going like, first you find one set that's maybe where, where you had a string that was a little bit too likely and then you fix that and now you keep going and maybe inside that find another yep. um, index set that is a little bit too likely and you take all of the unions of all the, I guess, are they called IJs yes. that you were searching for? Yeah, XJs. X, and then like, but, but as you're saying, since they are a little bit too likely but the overall entropy was still pretty good somehow relatively speaking the entropy of what's inside there has to sort of go up all the time i'm not yeah. saying this very uh, well maybe but yeah you're kind of in this you're 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 you know basically for these two likely assignments exactly how likely they are right they're like not quite one minus delta log m but not much more uh, but not much less than that and so you play this game where it's like well, they're not so likely that we have to care about them, right? If we have to toss them out and go to a different 
uh, slice, then that's fine. But they're likely enough that if we actually do fix this assignment, we get a noticeable drop in the um, in the deficiency. Like, you know, we're actually making progress. This is something that the we the decision tree should care about. So that that's sort of the balancing act that you're playing. Mm -hmm. And then you also had some some cleaning that, that you had to do on there. You you have to fix things up on the Y side also somehow. Yeah, yeah. You're gonna yeah, you toss out uh yeah, in order to use this fact that we only really have full range, not uh uniformity, we remove everything that isn't close to uniform and then apply full range, mm -hmm. which ends up being roughly the same thing. That was yeah what we did in this uh, point number three here. This is y equals versus y not equals. Basically saying take y equals, which is everything that's in those bad yj betas, throw it out. We know that we've removed at most half of y total. Then switch over to the other side and use the full range lemma to know that we actually can still get everything, which tells us that there's still a good row left. OK, thanks. All right, so is everyone pretty happy with this? I think we're waiting to see what graduated lifting is. <laughs> Very exciting. So, grad oh, whoa. so graduated lifting is um, just, just a little bit of background on this. So this is what I was working on when I got involved in this project. Graduated lifting is lifting where you no longer have the gadget size depend on the input size, but rather on the decision tree lower bound that you're shooting for. Uh, this was kind of my entrance into lifting theorems. I told my advisor that I would never work on lifting theorems and I'm here now, so that didn't work. But uh, we wanted to get lower bounds on automatability for tree-like cutting planes. And the trick was that we only, the lower bounds we were shooting for were like polylogarithmic in depth. They were not, um, you know, full like n. And the problem is when you lift uh, with a gadget of size log n, that can sort of swamp a poly, uh, a, a log n squared lower bound, you know, the, the parameters get too tight. So we needed a, a much smaller gadget size and we wanted to leverage the fact that we only were going, you know, d rounds, not the full n. So uh, using, we did that in the old setting where there was a different proof of this main full range lemma or whatever equivalent it was. When we switched to this side, um, the big issue of course is that we can no longer apply the uh, we can no longer apply that special lemma, which required that what uh, one minus delta log m. This thing is greater than essentially log n log m. Uh, so that's that's where we get stuck. In fact, even if I replace this n by a d, which it turns out I can. We still get the uh, we still get that we need like m to the well okay actually no sorry I'm getting ahead of myself this really is like log n log m uh, so that's that's kind of our bottleneck we have to pick um, yeah that's our bottleneck so we need to find an, a, another way around this um, and again this is what I was originally working on because I wasn't, I was working on it before uh, this new Sunflower paper came out uh, in 2019. And so what we were working with was uh, old technology that wasn't even good enough for us, uh, good enough to get the, the full range lemma. And so I'm gonna go through that real quick right now. So as I mentioned at, in answer to your question, Jakob, at the very end of the first part of the talk, uh, the sunflowers we're working with are actually what are called robust sunflowers. So this was defined by, I think, Ben Rossman, um, in 2010-ish, and a p epsilon robust sunflower, this is p not rho, um, is a set system S. Again, there's some common intersection. Um, there's some common intersection C, and now instead of requiring that all the sets are disjoint, we're gonna say that the probability, if you take a p biased set from the universe U with the core removed, the probability that for all uh, gamma in S, 
that uh, gamma is not a subset, uh, uh, well, sorry, gamma with the core removed is not a subset of Y, this thing is at most epsilon. So this should look pretty familiar from the earlier parts of the talk. The only differences are now there's a core. So every, every element in capital S shares this core C. So we have to remove it when we're taking a sample over Y because we don't want to just randomly you know, not take the core. And we are allowing Y to be a p-biased set. So this is a robust sunflower. And the reason it's called a robust sunflower is it's not too hard to see that the hardest case for Y in order to avoid all of the sets in S is when they're disjoint. Because if you have two sets in your set system S that have this common intersection, say there's this one element, then in order for Y to avoid both of these sets, it can get basically get a two for one by just avoiding, um, avoiding that one element. And then you know that neither set will be fully contained in Y. So somehow the worst case is when you're act we actually have a sunflower. Uh, but it's robust in the sense of we'll allow some overlaps as long as this quantity that we care about uh, is still small. So the lemma that we were using in the, in the first part of the talk is that if F has high blockwise min entropy, then there's a one half epsilon robust sunflower somewhere in F. And in particular, it has an empty core. This is just this definition up here, but with the C removed. So that was the lemma as I stated it before. And now we're going to, we no longer have high blockwise min entropy or you know, not good enough because M is too small. So we're gonna have to use a different lemma. And I'm gonna use slightly worse parameters here just to kind of show it off. But um, from the same paper, there's a lemma that actually uses this lemma or I guess this lemma uses it, which says that if F is just large enough and all the sets uh, in F are small enough, then you have a one half epsilon robust sunflower. And now you get no promises about the core. So just for comparison, we had er uh, Erdos Reto from the 60s, which said that F, as long as F is greater than or equal to D factorial times K to the D, then you'd get K petals where D is the uh, bound on the size of the sets. And now A plus 19 says that as long as F is of size, actually, I think this is the numbers according to Rossman, as long as the size of your set is at least a log one over epsilon, uh, it's actually, let's see here, it should be one over P times log one over epsilon to the D, then you get epsilon uh, robust sunflower, uh, P epsilon. So uh, by the way, uh, to your point, this is sort of where, uh, where I couldn't find a lower bound against our, uh, our technique. Uh, in order to draw a connection between robust sunflowers and sunflowers, you actually set P to be like one over K, which means that this lower bound that you want on the size of F is like K times log one over epsilon. And of course, the lower bound on traditional sunflowers that we have is like k minus one to the to the d. So there might be a more clever construction, a way of converting robust sunflowers to sunflowers, such that that um, factor disappears, and it really the log one minus ep, uh, one over epsilon is carrying the whole thing. At which point, I'll be concerned. But until we can figure a way around that, it seems like this uh, this factor is inherent. So it's kind of a very technical dodge, but uh, it's a, a good enough for us since we're always using P as one half. All right. So here's our main lemma for graduated lifting and I'll only have time to uh, give the intuition behind it, but I really wanted to do this lifting theorem partially because it's near and dear to my heart and partially because I think it really showcases uh, this connection between lifting and sunflowers in a way that isn't just that they use each other's tools. Um, so the main lemma is that if you have some set X, um, which is a subset of M to the N, I'm using capital N to denote, you know, some number of coordinates, the free coordinates. So if X has blockwise min entropy 0 0.95 or, you know, one minus delta log M minus order one, 
And we have a set system F such that all sets in F obey two rules. One, the size of the set is small, most order D, where D is the decision tree lower bound we're shooting for. And second, that some X uh, in our system actually, uh, in our set capital X uh, actually agrees with gamma. So gamma is a restriction of little x to some, uh, of its, uh, some of its coordinates. Then if these two conditions hold, then the probability of a random set y not uh, covering any of the sets gamma in f, this probability is like two to the minus d log m. So this is pretty analogous to our y not, our argument for the uh, y not equals side, right? This is the probability that we actually care about. Um, and you know we can sort of design it such that y not equals has size at least two to the mn minus, or I guess y itself has two to the mn minus d log m. This is where the d and row structured comes in handy. So. That's going to be how we get our contradiction in sort of the same way. And remember, we retooled the uh, union bound, so it didn't depend on the size of M. So this is, uh, we're gonna show that this is true, yeah. So that's really where this main lemma comes into uh, in handy. And one thing to notice is that um, this, this condition here, this gamma is less than or equal to order D, is technically not inherent in our rectangle partition. Um, like you can kind of get it from the deficiency condition, but another way that you can get it is simply remove all sets that have size at least D, uh, all sets XJ such that IJ is, uh, you know, omega of D. And it just turns out since those sets are so huge, uh, they can't, they can barely contribute anything to the total size of x, no matter how likely the assignment is. So that, that's just a small note. I'm not really going to go into uh, using, the, using this for the main proof, because pretty much everything is the same. There's a little condition at the end about the full range lemma that you have to change, but everything basically holds as before. I want to talk about this lemma itself. So is the statement of the lemma clear? I guess I'll sort of hold this up for a second while I start to write down below. All right, so the way we're going to prove this is we're going to show uh, equivalently that F uh, contains a one half, oops, one half, two to the minus d log m robust sunflower with an empty core. So again, this is the same thing. This is what we uh, got out of our earlier lemma where we had blockwise min entropy on the actual set. But, uh, oh, oh, sorry, I should note, uh, before we applied the um, sunflower lemma to X directly, now we're applying it to this F. And I didn't actually say what F was, but F is as before, uh, the set of all two likely assignments. So now we won't di work directly on X because uh, we'd have to apply block Y, or we'd have to apply a lemma where the length of this, or the size of the sets is N. Now we're going to apply to a set system where the size of the sets is at most D, namely F itself. So this is good enough for us because we don't actually need, like we used full range just to show that there was some IJ alpha J which had full range. And this is basically gonna do the same thing for us directly. All right, so the goal is to show that F contains a one half two to the minus D log M robust sunflower with an empty core. Uh, and so the first step, I'm just gonna move this out of the way. Uh, the first step is to show that the size of F is big. So for the moment, or I'm just going to assume that every set in F uh, has size exactly, let's say S. This is some fixed number, which is order D. 
I'm just going to assume all the sets have the same size. I can do an averaging argument to remove this assumption, but it's unimportant. So they're all going to have the same size, S. So I want to show that F is big. And this is going to be sort of like our deficiency argument. What we're going to say basically is that um, if F is small, oh, sorry, not the deficiency argument. This is the uh, Y equals part. Yeah, the y, the y equals part. If f is small, then uh, the total size of x, this is at most the uh, size of f times 2 to the minus uh, 1 minus delta log m times uh, the size of x, right? Each of these sets is taking up. It, it, you know, uh, sorry, this should be, okay. One minus delta log M minus order one, because that's our uh, blockwise min entropy. And this is times S because all the sets have size S. And then this is times X. So each set in F takes up at most this much of a fraction of X is all that this is saying. And again, f big here is going to be like f has size at least uh, 2 to the 1 minus delta log m or s log m uh, plus order s. So again, we're, we keep uh, switching back and forth. Sometimes we care about the fact that the blockwise min entropy of all of these sets is better than, or you know, is a little bit more likely than 0 0.95 log m. And sometimes we use the fact that it's not that much more likely. Here we're using the fact that it's not that much more likely. So we're going to kind of play both sides of the aisle in it, but such is life. So this is, uh, this is all that this is saying. Um, so f is big. And so as a result, uh, we can apply the robust sunflower lemma uh, as is to get some sunflower S with a core C. So this is, uh, this is something that we get out of the robust sunflower lemma. And this is in our set F. All right, we got some robust sunflower. Um, and the robust sunflower is going to be applied to epsilon again, like two, mi two to the minus d log m. So if core is empty, uh, then we're done, right? This, our only goal is to find a robust sunflower with an empty core. But uh, you know we can't really hope to be so lucky. It's quite likely that it actually does have a core. And here's an idea that, although I didn't realize it at the time, this is uh, basically how the proof of DNF sparsification works. The idea is remove the sunflower from F, but throw the core back in. So we're going to define F. Uh, we're going to define, call it F prime, is going to be F minus the set S plus uh, the core. All right, uh, simil so a similar argument, which I'm not going to show here, shows that f, the size of f prime is big. And so by extension, we can apply the robust sunflower lemma and get uh, s prime, sunflower s prime with a core c prime. And here's my claim. c prime is the core of a one half two epsilon robust sunflower in the original F, not F prime. And the way that we see this is, okay, here's our, um, S prime. So this is the, the one with core C prime. Here's the core C prime. Um, and then we here are all the petals. 
of, uh, that are contained in S prime. Some of them overlap, some of them don't. And if, uh, if, the, if uh, C never appears in it, if C is out here, then we know that this is a robust sunflower in the original thing, actually a one half epsilon robust sunflower, uh, because this part of F prime is basically just, uh, you know, was all in F as well. But we probably can't assume that we're that lucky. So we have also here the core C. And notice that in the original set system F, we didn't just have C, we actually had a bunch of petals as well. We had everything that we removed from S. And now we want to calculate the probability that a random Y misses every set. And I claim that it can miss every set S prime in two ways. So we're going to basically just be using a union bound. First, there's the probability that y misses, uh, sorry, the probability in f that y misses s prime. So that's the probability that in f prime, y misses s prime. So this means that y manages to avoid all of these sets and also the core c, right? Because that was what was actually in our set system f prime. And if we miss the core C, then we miss everything in the sunflower S. Sorry, this is the sunflower S, because all of those uh, had a common intersection in C. So that would be one way to miss all of our sets. And the other way is that um, it misses all of these sets out here, which I'm going to ignore. And then it individually misses every set in S without missing the core. So this is the probability in the set system S that Y misses every gamma. And this first thing, this is at, uh, this is epsilon because you know by definition S prime uh, is an one half epsilon robust sunflower in F prime. And this thing is epsilon because S itself was a one half epsilon robust sunflower. So that's it. Uh, that's, that's basically the, the last trick. So this is showing that if we just toss the uh, core back into the set system and up our failure probability by a slight amount, uh, we can still assume that any core that we find is a core in the original sunflower. And so just to make clear what our actual procedure will be, we're going to have a bunch of buckets one, two, three, four, all the way up to S, or rather S minus one. And we're going to basically keep pouring in sets from F, into, uh, like cores in from F. And as the buckets overflow, we're going to find cores in those and push them down. So the strategy is um, find a one half, okay, so let's let's say, we're going to initialize epsilon to be something 2 to the minus d log m minus s squared log m, something much, much smaller than minus d log m. Um, we're going to initialize all of our buckets, sk, to be empty for k uh, in s minus 1. And then while no empty core, find a one half epsilon robust sunflower in F, add core C to the bucket S size of C. If uh, the size of, uh, if a bucket overflows, and overflows here is it becomes large enough that we can apply the robust sunflower lemma to it, apply robust sunflower lemma to that bucket, add core C to S size of C. And of course, in all of these steps, we're removing the original sets. So remove S 
the sunflower S from F. And here we're going to remove this sunflower S from the bucket of CK, whatever it was. And we're just going to keep repeating this procedure. Oh, right, sorry. And then we're going to increment epsilon. Epsilon goes to, it gets epsilon plus some tiny little amount, its initial value actually, two to the minus d log m minus s squared log m. And we're going to maintain some invariance this whole time. Ma namely, we're going to maintain that the size of f is always big enough to apply the robust sunflower lemma. We're going to maintain that each of the individual sets SK is small enough. So in particular, it's going to be two to the one minus, well, actually it's going to be, I'm going to put in some numbers here, nine, five S log M. Here we're going to maintain that it's at most like 0 0.5 times K log M. And we're going to maintain that our epsilon is less than or equal to uh, two to the minus D log M. And notice here that every time we find a sunflower, the core is going to go into a bucket, uh, a further down bucket. I'm actually going to add a zero bucket here. So somehow these cores are all going to cascade down and eventually we're going to add something to the zero bucket. And the zero bucket is an em is, means the empty core. And by uh, the argument that I said above, that means that the empty core is an a one half epsilon robust sunflower in the original set system F for whatever the current epsilon is. So we always increment it just enough. Actually here, this robust sunflower lemma. So here we're gonna have a one half epsilon robust sunflower lemma. Here it's gonna be a one half. And again, this base amount, two to the minus D log M minus S squared log M. That way we know that we can in increment epsilon only by that amount. Uh, and I picked S squared because you might find like S squared cores, essentially. You can find at most like S cores of size S or something like that. Anyway, you pick the numbers such that you'll never run off the end and you'll never get too large an epsilon, but also that you're guaranteed in the end to find an empty core. Uh, and by the way, the way that you argue that F stays large is that you argue that whenever you take a sunflower out of F, um, the amount of x's that it can cover in the exact same way as um, my argument up here, the amount of x that it can cover is at most like one minus delta log m for, uh, times the size of the core fraction of x. And so somehow you can argue that you never go that you never use up more than like half of x, which means you can always apply that base argument to show that f still is big. So that's pretty much everything about how this lemma is proven. And I just think it's very cool because even uh, like the way that uh, this robust sunflower lemma without an empty core is used to prove this robust sunflower lemma with an empty core goes on a very similar flavor. And again, there's this DNF specification lemma by Rasborov that also has a similar flavor where you replace a bunch of terms in DNF with the core. Uh, treating them as set systems and your failure probability only goes up by like this additive epsilon. So somehow all of these things are very uh, interconnected. And here we're doing, uh, the only twist really is that we've got this blockwise min entropy set X and then we've got this set F laid over top of it. And that's really like the core of all of our lifting partition stuff. So it seems like the current arguments that use these uh, rectangle partitions are very closely related to sunflower arguments themselves, not just using uh, lemmas from sunflowers. And that's pretty much all I wanted to say for the technical part. Um, so I'll open up the floor to any questions uh, on any of this. You can ask me about DAG-like lifting, EPP lifting, uh, anything else I'm interested in. Whatever. I'm a little bit curious about, maybe you discussed this in the paper. Um, if I, suppose I want like a, a round aware version of this where I want to keep track of the number of rounds Alice and Bob use and somehow translate this into the decision tree. Oh, I see. So they're allowed to, they're allowed to speak as many bits as they want at a time. 
Yeah. Um, so that gets pretty dodgy because Alice can just communicate her entire. Um, no, no, no. You keep track of both. So, so there's a. Oh. I mean, there's this version we had for the, uh, I guess, um, original uh, GPW lifting where. Um, you can have like there's such a I think it Valiant had this notion of parallel decision trees, mm -hmm. where uh, you now care about the depth of the decision tree and you care about the total number of queries, but it's like uh, uh, you're optimizing what is this called? Like uh, you're you're optimizing two parameters now, like if you only care about the depth then the, the parallel decision tree would just issue one query for everything. Now the depth is wonderful, but, uh, but of course sure. the query complexity is terrible. If it only cares about the total amount of queries, then it would just be a standard decision tree. Right. And it would just you know query one bit at a time and then think about what to do. But maybe we're trying to strike some kind of balance that we want a, a somewhat shallow tree, uh, mm -hmm. but at, at expense of, of querying a little bit more. And now if you think about communication complexity, this translates into uh, that you might want to optimize both the total communication of Alice and Bob, but you also want to put an upper limit on the number of rounds they have. Am I making sense? Sure. So um, I guess what I would immediately think of is that what you would get, so if you're allowed to send a lot of bit, if you send a lot of bits in one round, then your blockwise min entropy is gonna drop, not by order one, but like, um, uh, let me use a different letter, um, B, where B is the number of bits they're sending in a round. Mm -hmm. right? So the rest of the argument all goes through, the only thing you have to be careful about is uh, that you can apply the full range lemma. So your only restriction now on the gadget size is it's a gadget such that one minus delta log m minus b is at least um, is at least you know log n log m mm -hmm. or something. So that's not such a huge loss. You might pay a little bit in the the size of the the gadget, but I mean up until b is like uh, some factor depending on log m, you don't even really have to worry about it. Uh, where you might end up paying is in this deficiency argument uh, because you no longer have just a minus delta drop. No, actually, I, it should be strictly better for us because we're on the, it is fairly, uh, fairly predictable side of the argument on that one. Yeah, I think that um, you basically just pay a little bit in the gadget size for this, each, uh, for this lockwise min entropy uh, condition. Mm -hmm. Other than that, I don't see anywhere else where it would be affected. Oh, I, uh, no, yeah, yeah, I think that's my answer. Okay. And somewhere in between, I guess, BPP and, and um, deterministic communication, did you think about real communication? Yeah. Um, so by the way, I should say that BPP, um, that we have this new union bound argument that works. We haven't actually gotten the sunflower argument to work for the, for the, BPP part because you really need uniform marginals there. And this drop I have up here of two to the minus i j log m seems to be a little too much. So awesome. we don't actually have BPP, but I will say about uh, real lifting. Real lifting imposes no real, uh, sorry, no real uh, additional constraints on this. Cause as usual, you know, you have a triangle, you find the biggest rectangle in it. Now, Tony swears that there's an issue with the DAG like lifting. So I sort of went over it the other day cause I had never, paid as much attention as I should have to the triangle lifting. But it seems like they're the same sort of argument should work. I don't think, I think you can get the, the exact gadget size you want and to the one plus epsilon for real lifting in both the tree-like and the dag-like case. Um, we actually, we have a, the ITCS deadline this week. So I'm gonna be thinking about that quite a bit for a write up. Uh -huh. So if I think of anything, I'll, uh, I'll get back to you. But uh -huh. no, real lifting shouldn't pose any issue. Um, yeah, by the way, I wanna, I wanna make a quick note here of something that I didn't talk about in the rest of the talk. I switched to this one minus delta just to make it clear that you know you can pick the gadget size as close to n to the one plus epsilon as you want. You can actually pick delta to be not a constant. You can pick it to be like, you know, one over log log m or something if you really wanted to. You could pick it as small as you want as long as it's not like one over log m because then 
this dis deficiency drop is trivial. It's like your, your blockwise min entropy threshold is uh, log m minus one or something. Um, so you can pick it to be a non-constant and where you're gonna end up paying, um, in fact, it's kind of direct in the argument, you're gonna end up paying exactly here. So if you pick delta to be not a constant, then your deficiency drop is no longer constant multiple of i, ij log m. And so your decision tree lower bound uh, is going to be right here. You know, you have j is at, this should be at most, 2 over delta times d. So if you pick delta to be like something like log m, then what you end up showing is that 1 over log m, then you get the decision tree complexity is at most d log m. In other words, you get a decision tree of the same height as the uh, communication protocol. So then you don't get these tight upper and lower bounds because the there's a, you know uh, the communication protocol seems like it's much more efficient there, but you still get something, uh, and that allows you to drive down de uh, delta, which by extension means you can get the gadget size as low as like n log m. So you can get to real or n log n rather. You can get very, very close to a linear size gadget um, if you're willing to pay that price. And there's, there's no other argument that's needed. You just play with delta, that's it. Okay, thanks. I think we, uh, you know, got a lot of, you, you worked hard and uh, we have seen a lot of the details. So I think we all think can with a good conscience could Call it a day. Uh, All right. Well, email me if you've got any more questions. I this stuff is fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, it's a fascinating area. Um, I'm thinking, I don't know. So, so thank you so much. Thank you for having me for this seminar. Thanks a lot. Thank you.